Mountain News First at Four continues. We begin this half hour with some breaking news out of Floyd County. A Floyd County school bus was involved in a crash at the intersection of Kentucky 680 and Kentucky 80. Now, the good news is that the Board of Education tells us no students were hurt in the crash and EMS is at the scene. Again, we do not believe any students were hurt. But again, this is at the intersection of Kentucky 680 and Kentucky 80, a school bus involved in a crash this afternoon. We'll, of course, update this story when we get more information. A trial could be held before the Kentucky State Senate sometime this session as part of impeachment proceedings. The Senate adopted a resolution moving forward after the impeachment of a Commonwealth attorney earlier this month. Ronnie Lee Goldie was impeached and now the Senate will decide whether to convict and remove him from office. Goldie resigned but could technically hold office again. WYMT's Phil Pendleton has more on what took place in Frankfurt today. Ronnie Lee Goldie's resignation will take effect next week, but if two thirds of the Senate votes to convict, according to the Kentucky Constitution, he will not be able to hold public office again. The House voted unanimously to impeach Goldie, who is accused of doing favors for a criminal defendant in exchange for nude photos of her. Goldie has been the prosecutor for Bath, Menifee, Montgomery, and Rowan County since 2013. Today, the Kentucky Senate adopted a resolution that will put them as part of the impeachment proceedings. It would be what most people would be perceive to be a trial, a jury trial with 38 members sitting, but with a subcommittee that would make recommendations. And this marked the first time since 1991 that the Kentucky House has moved forward with an article of impeachment. And according to the evidence that they looked at, there were 190 pages of illicit messages between Goldie and a criminal defendant. And Frankfurt, Phil Pendleton, now back to you. Phil, thank you. The legislative session ends March 30th, so as expected, the trial will take place in the Senate before then. President Stivers also said an agreement could be reached before that, and so a trial would not have to take place. So a lot to go on that story. Well, one Floyd County nonprofit has been hard at work since July's historic flood. God's Appalachian Partnership, or GAP, helps folks in their communities by repairing homes, providing hot meals, and more. Since the July flooding, groups have come to work with GAP from across the country to help flood victims repair their homes. But Executive Director John Morris says it's more than just meeting a single need. Our very point is to be able to, uh, is to not just meet a physical need, but also know to meet their emotional and spiritual need and to share with them who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for them. And so in everything that we do, we share with them the love of Jesus. Morris added, this has been wonderful to welcome in all the groups from across the country that have come in to help folks in his community. We'll have more from GAP tonight at 6. While the Asbury Revival had its final night last night, the movement is still spreading. A different organization unaffiliated with Asbury is hosting a revival in Lexington. Pulse Movement is inviting folks to come to Rupp Arena to continue the spirit of the Asbury Revival on Sunday. Although Asbury is not directly involved with Pulse or the upcoming event, they say they are thrilled to see the revival spreading. President of Pulse, Nick Hall, says he believes the revival was birthed in Kentucky and is excited about the ability to use Rupp to house anyone that wants to come. The good thing about being at Rupp Arena is there's 20,000 seats. We want to see grandpa and grandma there. We want to see mom and dad there. Why? Because I believe that God wants us to come together as generations. We need mothers and fathers. We need mentors. We need people to disciple these young men and women. Well, the revival will be from 2 p.m. until 11 p.m. at Rupp, and admission will be free.
Well, the weather is cool and calm across the mountains as we close out the work week. Here's a live look right now over in Pulaski County overlooking downtown Somerset. Current temperature 48 degrees under a cloudy sky in this location, but a little bit of blue sky here in downtown Hazard overlooking Triangle Park. Current temperature 52 degrees, so a little bit warmer here in Perry County. Middle 40s near I-64, middle 50s near the Kenneth Kentucky Tennessee border 55 in Harlan 45 for Moorhead and 48 over in Somerset. The good news on radar. Most of us are quiet. Maybe a few sprinkles south of Highway 80, but for most of us we are quiet with cloud cover continuing into this evening, but look off to the south more showers moving into our direction and that will set the stage for a soggy start to the weekend on tomorrow morning. We see more showers on Saturday, but if you have any plans this evening, we do stay dry for most of us. Only a small chance of a few sprinkles, especially over our southern counties. Temperatures falling into the upper 30s and lower 40s, but another warm up is on the way by next week. All those details coming up in just a little bit. Steve. All right, Cameron, thank you. The seventh house in the Housing Can't Wait initiative has been completed. Housing Can't Wait was sparked by local nonprofits meeting to address community needs after the July flood, and there is now physical proof of their partnerships. Housing Development Alliance Assistant Director Chris Dahl says the bond each organization shares has been crucial to this process. That we all had that and felt that common urge to do that together. I think it's even more important that that was in place beforehand, that we knew each other and we trusted each other so that when the disaster happened, we knew we could rely on those existing networks. The house was gifted to a Breathitt County family. This is in Perry County. And we'll have more on the family receiving the house tonight at 6. It, it, is it identity theft if you use someone's name while committing fraud? That's a question the U.S. Supreme Court will address next week. The case Dubin versus the United States centers on Austin, Texas psychologist David Dubin, who was found guilty of fraudulently billing for Medicaid. The government has also charged Dubin with aggravated identity theft because the bill contained a patient's name and Medicaid ID. Pepperdine Law Professor Joel Johnson says the issue is vague wording in a law passed in 2004 that states someone can be charged with identity theft if they identify another person while committing fraud. To deal with, at the time, what were growing concerns about um, identity theft, um, which sort of in the new internet age at the time was becoming more and more prevalent. And so Congress um, enacted this statute to, to create a separate offense um, above and beyond. Johnson says the law allows prosecutors to threaten fraud defenses with charges that should not be relevant. The court will take the case up on Monday. The University of Idaho plans to tear down the house where four college students were murdered in November. U of I says the previous owner of the off-campus residence in Moscow gave it to the school. The school says the demolition is to promote healing and avoid sensationalizing the crime scene. It has not named a date. Plans are in the works for a memorial garden to honor the victims. In addition, the school is working to establish scholarships in each of their names. First Lady Jill Biden says there's pretty much nothing left to do but choose the time and place for President Joe Biden's re-election announcement. The First Lady made the comments in an exclusive interview with the Associated Press in Kenya, the second and final stop of her five-day visit to Africa. The President has long said it is his intention to seek re-election, but he has yet to make it official, keeping the political world in suspense. President Biden has faced questions about whether he is too old to continue serving as president. He would be 86 at the end of a second term. Coming up on First at Four, hurricane damage and a disease are squeezing Florida orange crops, leading to higher prices for OJ. And the weekend is looking pretty soggy at times. All those details coming up next.